I'm the oldest of eight kids, and one of the things that I developed out of that upbringing was a thing I call people radar. In 100 yards, if I see your white-haired grandmother getting off an airplane clutching her ticket and she's in distress, I swear to God I'll see her. Or I'll see your two-year-old get away from you and maybe head toward the escalator in harm's way. I mean, I, I just see those things. But it's useless unless you somehow act to help. I saw the flight attendant that was working my side of first class. Her name is Jan Murray. She's obviously concerned and distressed. I reached out and I just touched her in the arm and she went by and I said, Jan, don't worry about this. This thing flies fine on two engines. We just simply need to get to a lower altitude. We're going to be fine. She just gave me a, a kind of a focused look and said, oh, no, Denny. Both the pilots are trying to fly the airplane, and the captain has told us that we have lost all our hydraulics. DC-10s must have hydraulics to fly them, period. There's nothing you'll find in any of McDonnell Douglas publications or the FAA approved manuals that will address the loss of all hydraulics in a DC-10. Why? Because the DC-10, like all airplanes, are designed to a factor of 10 to the minus ninth. That problems such as this will not happen to a factor of one in a billion. There was no procedure for this. And therefore, the outcome as we could perceive it was not good. A flight attendant is not a pilot. And I said, would you go back to the cockpit, tell the captain there's a DC-10 training check airman back here. If there's anything that I can do to assist, I'd be happy to do so. And when she came out of the cockpit, she came around the corner, saw me standing there, and she stopped dead in her tracks and just went. <laughs> I opened the door. The scene to me as a pilot is unbelievable. Both the pilots were in short sleeve shirts, the tendons being raised in their forearm, their knuckles were white. They had turned the control yoke, the yoke we use as a wheel, all the way against the stops. We're asking the airplane's left wing to go down, and the right wing keeps falling. We want the nose to go down, we push forward. They are pushing for all they're worth, and the first officer was slouched in his seat, and he has his knee on it to exert more pressure, trying to force it down. But the airplane continues to climb. And I looked at the second officer's panel. All the hydraulic gauges indicated zero quantity and zero pressure. The captain said, go back and see if anything's moving if there's any of these flight controls were responding to their inputs. If you remember as a kid, you know, you had your hand outside the window of a car that was driving down the road at say 40 miles an hour. But if you raised your hand, <laughs> ailerons, elevators, which are in the tail to control the pitch, and rudders, which control the yaw, those act in the same way as your hand did in a car. If I ask for the left aileron to go up, the right aileron goes down. They'll never both be up. They just aren't built that way this way or that way. It's yin and it's yang. Just back of the second door, there's a spot in the coach cabin where you can have a look out a window right down the length of each wing. And I looked out the wing and they're both floating up. Impossible if you're pressurized with hydraulics. It can't happen. Scary proposition.
This airplane had this inherent tendency to want to roll on its back to the right, it seemed. And the only way that Al could have any control of it was he'd reach up and he grabbed the throttle, the gas pedal for the left engine under the left wing, and he pulled it back to idle. And he'd take the one for the right engine, the wing that was falling, and he'd push it to its maximum power. And that power setting slowly but surely would bring that right wing back up again. You had to pull it, modulate it to try to keep the wings level. Terribly hard thing to do. If you were driving your car with power steering, the engine stalled, where you've tried to steer it to a stop. If you can imagine that force and take it up a factor of four, that's what it took to move these controls between the two of them. Tremendous physical exertion. I wasn't doing anything. I said, Captain, would you like me to work your throttles for you? And I stood between the two pilots, leaning forward, and I began to operate the throttles. That left the captain only with the yoke to fight. I was in foreign country. This is places nobody had been before. We didn't know what it was going to take. We just had to learn as we went. So basically, what we did is we started with a box this big, trying to make it this big so we could land. These three men were not known to me. They were all Seattle-based, and I'm out of Chicago. At the time, I think we had 7,500 pilots on the airline, so we didn't know each other by name, face, or reputation. The only thing that was controlling his aircraft, in fact, was his throttles, although I don't think it was quite clear to him at that time that that's the only thing that was controlling. He transferred to a perfect stranger the control of his aircraft. Now, that is an amazing thing if you will take into consideration that pilots don't give up control very easily. As I stood there beginning to operate the throttles, he reached over his right shoulder with his hand and said, Hi, I'm Al Haynes. And he introduced himself to me in this incredible environment we were in. And I gratefully reached forward and I shook his hand and I said, Hi, I'm Denny Fitch. First officer is struggling with the yoke? Correct. What good is that doing? You ask any pilot, no matter what he's flown, whether it's been fighters, light airplanes, or what, what has always saved the day for you when all else has gone to pot? What it always comes down to is your stick and your rudder skills. This is how we get up. This is how we get down. We've done it thousands and thousands of times. This is what we fall back on. This always works. This always works. Except today, it's not working. The second issue is, how do we know it's not working? How do we know it's not giving you something? Maybe it's giving you this much, but it's contributory. In other words, it's positive toward the outcome. How do you know? You can't afford to leave it ignored. So he is working this area. He's covering that base. We're working as three people on the same mission. You let go of it if you're the pilot. The first rule of any event we have in air is somebody fly the aircraft, keeping the wings level under control while whatever problems we're having are dealt with. Somebody fly the airplane. But how do you fly an airplane without controls? If you were sitting in a chair at altitude and watch this fly by, we would look like a sine wave. One minute we were climbing, then the next minute we were descending, then the next minute we were climbing, then we were descending what's known in aerodynamic terms as a fugoid. And the fugoid was going up and down 2,500 feet per minute on average. Every time we went through one of these up and downs, we had a net loss of altitude and we were getting closer and closer to the ground. When we fly an airplane, we try to maintain perfect